record, Dana Ice is with the Forum on Democracy and Trade. Um, for those of you I may not have seen before, and I think there will be one or two people in the room I've not met, um, the Forum on Democracy and Trade is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., but which I run from Orr's Island here in Maine, um, that works with public officials on issues regarding free trade agreements, trade policy, and how policies and trade agreements can affect a state's ability to legislate around certain issues. The issue that I have today to brief on briefly with you um, is a follow-up from a, a shorter briefing that I gave at the last meeting having to do with um, the issue of tobacco in the pending Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, this is a free trade agreement that's being negotiated now um, that will include the U.S. Um, in a group of nine countries. In January of 2010, uh, USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative, requested comments on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And at that time, Philip Morris International, the tobacco company, um, submitted comments to USTR um, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And in those comments, they asked for an expansion of investor arbitration. They asked for incorporation of WTO rules to protect tobacco trademarks and brands. And they also asked for expansion of cross-border services, which would include the distribution of tobacco specifically. Several weeks after they filed those comments with USTR, they invoked investor state arbitration and WTO trademark rules to challenge Uruguay's limits on tobacco brands and packaging. Now Uruguay has, I think at this time, the most stringent packaging regulations in the world for tobacco products. They require that 80% of cigarette packages be covered with graphic depictions of health warnings and the risks of smoking. Um, so it's easy to see why they were targeted. So at that point, um, Philip Morris sought investor state arbitration, which was allowed under the Switzerland Uruguay Bilateral Investment Treaty. <coughs> Looking back, <coughs> Philip Morris wants the TPP, the, the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement, to include the same legal tools that it's using against Uruguay through their bilateral investment treaty. And they also um, have publicly and candidly admitted that they're going after tobacco regulations in Australia and Singapore next. And Australia and Singapore are both members of the pending Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So the central issue here that I want to, to demonstrate for you is that if the TPP covers tobacco and trade and investment, Philip Morris is going to have a platform to challenge future tobacco regulations um, in the United States. And they would do that most likely through a subsidiary in another TPP country. Um, as a side note, um, you may have, there's been a lot in the news recently about tobacco regulations, but Congress recently delegated um, authority to the Food and Drug Administration here in the U.S. for, um, to, to regulate tobacco. And the dele this delegation is very similar to the authority that Philip Morris is targeting in Singapore right now. So there are two recent um, pending US actions that make all of what I've just told you even, even more interesting and a, and a little more urgent. And that is that just last week, the FDA announced that um, they've, they have come to a decision to require new, larger, and more graphic warning labels on cigarettes sold in the US. Um, just to describe it to you, cigarette packages as of October of 2012 will need to have 50% of the front of the package covered in warning labels and graphic depictions of what cigarettes can do to you. So the upper 50% of the package will have these images and warnings on them, leaving only the bottom 50% for branding, um, which I'm sure will be an issue for the tobacco companies. The second item of, is, uh, of interest to, has to do with the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The Framework Convention is the first global health treaty. It's been around since 2003, um, and it's been ratified by 171 nations. 
uh, the, the treaty sets global standards for its parties uh, to impose tighter controls on tobacco ingredients, packaging, and marketing, among other regulations. George W. Bush signed um, the treaty back in 2003, but he did not send it to the Senate. Um, it requires two-thirds majority vote uh, in order to ratify it. So at the same time last week that the FDA was announcing its new more stringent regulations for tobacco packaging, a White House spokesperson uh, reported that President Obama hopes to submit um, to the Senate um, this, this framework convention issue next year. So Philip Morris is really hoping to turn the framework convention's regulatory floors into ceilings. Uh, they pay very close attention when a member country exceeds the convention standards for regulating cigarette branding and packaging. With these new FDA standards in place, um, we now exceed the framework convention's um, standards for displaying warning labels on packaging. Framework convention only says that we need to have 30% of the package covered with these warnings. We're going for 50%. So at this point, the threat really grows that Philip Morris or other tobacco companies, for that matter, would target domestic regulations through investor state arbitration probably brought through uh, one of the foreign subsidiaries. So the forum strategy, in looking at all of this, we've had um, Robert Stumberg, Bob, for most of you, uh, who works at the Harrison Institute of Public Law at Georgetown University. He contracts with the forum. We've had him working on an analysis of this issue, um, which is very nearly done. It will be done completely today, because we're going to use it to submit comments to USTR next Monday. Um, and he's really looked at the issue very broadly, using it as a case study to show how you know, one trade agreement can create a web of rules on investment, intellectual property, and services. Um, his paper explores this, and he tries to show that there would be several ways to block um, a threat of tobacco in the TPP, but really the most effective way to eliminate the threat is to car specifically carve tobacco out of the TPP. And so that's what we would be recommending to, to USTR with our comments. So we will submit formal comments next week. Um, they're due on Monday. USTR had expanded the period for comments on the TPP because they included <coughs> Malaysia very recently, so they opened it up for comments again. So Monday the 22nd, we'll get those in. We will include Bob's paper in the comments. Uh, state letters, we've been talking with several states, including uh, Curtis, I've sent him a, a sample letter to consider as a template. Um, if you choose, states could also submit comments. Um, the deadline for official comment, as I said, is Monday the 22nd. Uh, we will be making contact with Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, as well as um, some FDA folks who are involved in tobacco regulation. They've been working very closely on these new regulations that are coming out, um, and of course, USTR. So this is the short-term plan. If we don't see momentum or, or any change or engagement on the part of USTR or others to, to carve the, this out of the TPP, um, I propose that we organize a, a high-profile event, <laughs> probably in Boston, which is the home of tobacco-free kids. Um, we have some other health NGOs that would most likely be interested to come in on this with us. Um, it would be an event where we brought together the, the Regional Trade Policy Oversight Commission folks, um, partner organizations, really any interested party who would want to participate. A briefing titled State Leadership in Tobacco Control and the TPP. So if you want to look at this issue from really the state's perspective and how states regulate tobacco and how that might come back at them should this occur. Um, we've managed to capture that in two pages very eloquently. I want to make has to do with the upcoming NCSL meeting. Um, the forum very recently was put on the agenda at, at NCSL, which is being held in Phoenix. Um, I think it's December 8th through the 10th. Um, but they've given us the floor at the Labor and Economic Development meeting. And Bob Stumberg will be there, I will be there, and 
Bob is going to give an overview of trade policy issues that are important to states, but then he's going to really hunker down and talk about GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And he's promised me he's going to weave tobacco into that conversation. There's a line from Robert Frost that says, before I build a wall, I'd want to know what I was walling in or walling out. And the, I may be in this last article. The United States is not the only place that produces tobacco. What, what is the largest tobacco growing country in the world? Um, I know that the largest tobacco company in the world is in China. Yeah, and Philip Morris is not the Wall Street Journal of the Economist yeah. where they had China was just the giant of this thing. And so I don't, I don't smoke anymore. I have no, just wondering if we do something here, what the pushback is on nothing happens in isolation. If we push back on this, as we you know, probably should, what are some of the ramifications from those countries that want to have access to this 300 million people that smoke a little bit? Is there any, any other larger issue in terms of trade? I'm going to focus on tobacco, which I think is a good idea, but uh, you have these trades with China, and that, that right. big, big, big piece of Well, carving it out of the TPP won't put a halt to trade. Um, it will simply mean that these companies won't be trading tariff-free, which would be the eventual goal. I mean, th this is a case study for the forum to really look at just tobacco and, and how it ties into other agreements. I mean, if you're part of a free trade agreement, um, you know, can it link into bilateral investment treaties? Can you draw a law from GATS as well? I mean, what, I think what Bob is finding is that there are so many agreements and treaties existing right now that everything kind of meshes. And if a company doesn't find a law that works for them and gets them you know, the, the, the end result that they're looking for, they can just go to another agreement and borrow it from there. So that's kind of what we're looking at here with tobacco. But this could, the same thing could be applied to any other industry, really. I mean, look, you could look at LNG services, you could look at, I, I don't know, just think of just about anything. So, you know, carving it out of the TPP simply means that we're saying that tobacco is, is off the table for investment arbitration under this particular agreement.